Okay, we'll begin then with a call to worship. With our, in our worship folders, we begin these words. The Son of a Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Heavenly Father, we ask that you make us willing ministers. Also renew our faith by the power of your gospel. Then send us out, equipped and enabled to share the message of Jesus' love. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our first hymn, Come Thou Almighty King. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought and word and deed. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, who has given your only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake, grant us remission of all our sins. And by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given his only Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe on his name, he gives power to become the children of God and has promised them his Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. Amen. And together we pray. O oh God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as surpass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love towards you that we may love you above all things and lead us by faith to your eternal promises, which exceed all that we can desire, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one true God, now and forever. Amen. And you're welcome to be seated. The Old Testament reading is taken from the book of Isaiah, chapter 55, verses 6 through 9. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours and my thoughts than your thoughts. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading is taken from the book of Colossians, chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. This is the word of the Lord. I invite you to stand for the reading of our gospel lesson. The gospel for today is found in Matthew chapter 20, beginning with verse number 1. 
For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. And so they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those who came were hired, who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work in the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Here ends the reading of our gospel lesson. You're welcome to be seated. We continue today with number five in a series. Uh, the series includes seven different installments in the book of Colossians. And we're, we're seeking to make the main one the main thing, uh, main thing. And today's subtitle is The Conquering Christ. Now, you, uh, when I was young and, well, when some of us were young, the Internet hadn't been invented yet, right? Um, that was, you know, 100 years ago or so. But the, uh, the Internet has all kinds of information, as you well know, and good things as well as bad things. But one of the things that you could find a lot on the internet is kind of fun sometimes to look at is top 10 lists. What are the top 10, you know, just name what it is, fill in the blank. And one of the things I've, I put in there one time is the, what are the top 10 fears? What are the top 10 things that people are afraid of in, in general? And I won't go necessarily through all 10, but one of them people like me need to get used to. The 10th one, going from 10 to 1, getting old. Anybody get afraid of getting old? I guess it doesn't matter if we're afraid or not. It's going to happen. Or the one, one that's particularly, um, particularly a, a, appropriate for today is germophobia. Uh, or we could add viruses too. I mean, look at where most of us are wearing masks. And, and it's not a, you know, I, don't, I get it. Uh, number six, fear of going crazy. And some of us were closer to that than others. Right? <laughs> there's a fear of intimacy that people have. And then there's a, a number four on the list going down from 10 to 1. It's kind of a list of things. There's things like fears of spiders and rats and cockroaches and snakes and airplanes and monsters and demons and mirrors. And, of course, that list goes on and on and on. What are you afraid of? Some people have a social phobia. And this is pretty common. You see that as, as pastors go to a seminary and they start learning how to speak in front of people. Some people have a fear of speaking in front of groups of people. And you kind of have to either get over it or not. I mean, it's just one of those things you got you to get over. And then there's the opposite fear in a sense. Well, I shouldn't say it's opposite. Another fear that sometimes goes along with it is agoraphobia, fear of being out in the open. And boy, preaching out in the open would be really hard for people with both of those particular phobias. But the classic and common fear that, that most people have around the world, or at least very commonly have around the world, is the fear of death. It's something that we all have to face. It's a reality that all of us have faced in one level or another. Either our spouse or, God forbid, one of our children have passed. And it's a terrible thing. It's a very, a, a very deep fear that a lot of people have. And I have a lot of you know, again, I always end up with too much information. I have maybe two hours worth of testimonies of people talking about their fears of 
death and different things, but I'll just choose one. This one woman writes, I was raised Methodist, and I still identify as a believer in God. Regardless, I feel terrified at the thought of death. What if I'm not a good person, and my afterlife is bad because of it? I am so scared. And that's a very common thought that people have. What if I don't measure up? What if there's something that I me missed in my life that, that negates my ability to get to heaven or that God somehow, I, I'm the one of all the creation who, who uh, committed that unforgivable sin and maybe God's going to be upset with me and I, I'm not going to make it. Fear that people have. And so we address that today with the book of Colossians chapter 2 in verses 13 and following because these verses here that we just read in our epistle lesson today point out three reasons at least three reasons I'm going to focus on three reasons we do not need to live in fear and all three of these focus on the person of Jesus Christ as the whole book of Colossians does and I'll give you my full outline right here at the front Christ conquered death Christ conquered our debt and Christ conquered the devil so we start with number one in the outline, verse 13. When you were dead in your, in your sins and the circ uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. Now we make fun of fear, I mean, because we all deal with it one way or another. But the reality is fear is good. I mean, fear is God-given. God gives us fear that we don't do stupid things. It doesn't always work. But fear is, is it's rational. Don't run across the freeway when there's cars going by. In fact, it's even better, don't run across the freeway ever. I mean, that's, that's a good fear to have. I'm, I'm afraid a little bit of, of poisonous or venomous snakes. I mean, that's a natural, that's not just fear, that's just rationality, right? You don't, you don't play with animals that can harm you or kill you. That's just, you know, that's just common sense to us. But when fear takes over our life, when we focus so much on fear and it consumes us, we need to do something about it. We need to go and maybe, maybe get some good Christian counseling to help us through this. Christian counseling is so very important for most of us, if not all of us, where they can help us change the way we think. And as we point people towards the scriptures and point people towards Jesus Christ, we can begin to change our, our fear and begin to live more and more each day by faith. And that's exactly what God calls us to do. Because if you look at the reality that one psychologist I was listening to said, well, what's the worst could ever happen to you? Well, I don't know. I could die. Well, what's so bad about that? When I die, I'm going to heaven. When I die, I'm going to meet my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When I die, I'm going to meet my father and my mother. I'm going to meet all those who have passed before me. I'm going to be free. I'm going to be exactly the way God had called me to be forever in heaven. How bad can that be? Now, I'm not taking away the idea of fear. We all have different kinds of fears. But I am trying to say, let's put it into proper context. Let's realize that our fear needs to be put and, and conquered and, and recognize that we can we could tell fear in this respect to go jump in the lake. A lot of times people want to make fun of Christianity. And I've, I've heard this on podcasts. I maybe I shouldn't be listening to, I don't know, but they make fun of Christianity by saying all oh, Christianity, it's just for the weak. It's those who can't deal with life on their own. And so they need some sort of crutch in their life. And if that's the case, I'm going to raise my hand and say, I am one of them. I am weak. I never had the choice of when and where and how I would be born. I don't have the choice in many of the things that happened. This country did not have a choice that this pandemic went through. It wasn't a choice that we have, but there's chaos around us. There's things that happen that are out of our control. In fact, I sometimes do this with, with coaching. I say, well, let's draw a line on a piece of paper. And on the one side of the paper, list all the things that are out of your control. Well, first of all, that list is never ending. What is, and so I said, now write all the things that are in your control. And that list is very small. What is in absolutely your own control? Very few things. But I cannot choose the weather. I cannot choose the pandemic. I cannot choose if bad, certain bad things happen. But I can look to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all and Lord over all. 
I didn't cause myself to be born. I can't rescue myself from ultimate death. There's something in, in science they call entropy. In fact, uh, Jim was just talking about uh, entropy regarding some tarps he bought. I was going to use the washing machine idea, but the tarps that he bought uh, that deteriorated in the sun within 105 days, I think you said, the warranty is 90 days. <laughs> and that's entropy in action, right? Entropy is things that have order, things that are made fall apart. And I see that every time I look in the mirror. Things fall apart. That's entropy. And I cannot control it. I don't control nature. I don't control physics. I don't control mortality. Most everything in our world is out of control. And death haunts us. I'm a fan of, I used to watch, uh, and I probably still would if I could find it, the reruns of MASH. You know, MASH was on the air a lot longer than the Korean War was <laughs> going on. But there's a scene in there where Colonel Henry Blake is talking to Hawkeye. And, and for those of you who don't know, Hawkeye's a surgeon. And Hawkeye performed a surgery and the young man, the soldier, died. And Hawkeye's having a very difficult time emotionally getting over this. I could have done more. I should have done this, whatever. And the Colonel Blake says this. All I know is what they taught me in command school. The first rule is that young men die. And rule number two, doctors can't change. Rule number one. It's a really interesting quote, isn't it? And that's the reality in which you and I live. And I hate to be the one to share this news with you. And if you have little kids around, might want to cover their ears at this next one. But the fact is, everybody in this room, in this outside, <laughs> not in a room, everybody around here, we're all going to die one day. But Paul in the New Testament, in fact, the whole gospel message starting in the book of Genesis in the Garden of Eden all the way through to the book of Revelation in the New Testament, which are talking about events that are yet to come for us historically. Every single book talks about the fact that God was going to send a messenger and more than a messenger. He was going to send a Messiah to suffer and die to give us life and life now and life forever. We have a hope, a sure and certain hope in Jesus Christ. When, God, when you were dead in your sins, God made you alive in Christ. And that's our first point. Christ conquered death. Number two, Christ conquered debt. He forgave us our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away and nailed it to a cross. When Paul wrote these words, he was living within the culture of Rome. And in the Roman culture, when you were arrested and convicted of a crime, you'd be put into a jail, for, for instance, and, and the punishment would be, let's say, jail time for this one. And the, the court system would write down the list of your offenses. This person is in jail for these reasons, and the sentence is, well, make up something, two years. And so they'd be two years in jail, and they put that over the jail cell. And when the person did their time, they did their two years, they would take that, that message, and they would, they would put the words paid in full on the front of it, and then it would get notarized by a judge, and then the person was released to the general population. If anyone came up to that person and said, hey, you were that guy that stole that whatever, he said, look, I, I paid my debt. Here is my, my writ that says it's paid in full. And that's what Paul is talking about with us, that Jesus came into our life, and yes, we are guilty. And yes, we've done things we should not have done. And yes, we continue to do things we, we should not do. But Jesus Christ put the stamp on our, on, our, on, our, on our words there and says, you have been forgiven and has been paid in full. Not only that, as you know, the Romans really liked to crucify. And that was their, their choice on how they would put somebody to death. And the same thing would happen when somebody was put to death. That the Romans would put down the charge. This person is, has a death penalty because. And they'd write down whatever it is. And they would nail it when they were crucifying somebody over their, over their head on the cross. And that's exactly what Pontius Pilate did with Jesus. And remember the words that he put on the writ over Jesus' head, it was, he, you know, the, the charge was, Jesus Christ is the king of the Jews. And remember, there was a controversy about that because the Jews says, that's not right. You shouldn't say he's king of the Jews. You should say he said he was king of the Jews. And Pilate's answer was, what I have written, I have written. In other words, you cannot, you cannot uh, change that. Now, when Jesus suffered and he died, it was because he was king 
of the Jews. If we had our own lives put onto a cross and there was a writ above our foreheads that said what we're charged with, what would we be charged with? And the image that comes to my mind be like one of those billboards on Interstate 80 that are so huge and it would be very small words written in quite a bit of detail over my head and all of it would be true because I'm a sinner. I am no righteousness. There's nothing in me intrinsically that, that, that is a part of me. But God says in Romans, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus conquered death. Jesus conquered debt. And number three, Jesus conquered the devil. And verse 15 of our text says, And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing, triumphing over them by the cross. Death haunts us. Debt suffocates us. And the devil tries to kidnap us. In the book of Ephesians, it says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and rulers of this dark world. So you have the story of all, for generation after generation, all the hate and all was all focused on one man, ultimately Jesus Christ. All the debauchery, all the greed, all the insufferable self-centeredness was all gathered and compiled heaped upon Jesus the Christ. And he's walking hunched over, bearing the weight of the cross and bearing the weight of all the sin of all the world as he goes towards Golgotha, literally burdened with the sins of every man, woman, and child. With deep sighs and inward groaning, Jesus went to the cross. And while that was happening, the devil is having, excuse the expression, a devil of a time celebrating that the Messiah of God, the one who is the Emmanuel, the God with us, the incarnate deity himself is walking hunched over, burdened beyond capacity and going to the cross in order to suffer more and to die. And it seemed obvious by every possible standard, the devil was going to win. The strongest strong man is suffering and the system that this strong man built is that he encouraged that he was trying to get his disciples to continue with was being torn down and washed away like a castle made out of sand. And the powerful Messiah was dying in pain and defeat and shame and everyone could see it. And they were listening to his words from the cross. And at one point in, on Good Friday, typically we use the, it's the Aramaic word Jesus was saying from the cross, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. And it's translated from Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it's an amazing, amazing thing that Jesus is God on that cross. And the burdens he was carrying, the sins of all of us and that separate us, that alienate us from our creator God, he was suffering from. That even God himself was struggling with how, the horror of our own sins the sins that you and I are guilty of. But he goes to that cross and he continues with a hoarse voice. He cries out for something to drink. And these witness, witnesses hear him call to his good friend and says, take care of my mom. And the devil partied. And it wasn't yet known by anyone, especially the devil itself, that it was all part of a plan. It was all necessary that God would become human. God would become flesh. And he would take upon himself both halves of the covenant. If you remember in the Old Testament, the first covenant was, I will be your God and you'll be my people. Obey my words. And they all said, yes, absolutely. And they immediately turned their back on God. And so God says through the book of Jeremiah and other places, there's coming a time when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel after that time. You'll not depend on the people's obedi strict obedience, but will be depend on God himself who will come to us and Jesus is on that cross. And he's carrying both halves of that covenant. 
and he makes the agreement with us in this new covenant time, this new, this new world, this new testament in which we live. He says, trust me, I did it all. I paid every single price. I paid for every single sin. Our sins are just are made just. We are reconciled. And Jesus on that cross was the bait. For those of you who are fishermen, you put worms on your hooks in order to get a fish. And Jesus was that worm. And he was pierced. And he was put into the chaos. And the devil took it. Hook, line, and sinker. And on Easter Sunday, what happened on Good Friday began to be made known. First to the devil himself. As he's recognizing what he had done, he took the bait, hook, line, and sinker. And the enemy himself realized suddenly, can you imagine the look on its face when he realized that he took the bait? And the party that was going on suddenly grew silent and the lights went out and the weeping and gnashing of teeth ensued. It was obvious on that Easter Sunday, what happened on Good Friday to the women who went to the tomb and they didn't see what they expected, a dead body that they were gonna properly prepare for long-term burial, but rather the living Jesus himself. It became obvious to the disciples on the road to Emmaus when they walked with the man that they didn't initially recognize until he went to the upper room with the other disciples and Jesus revealed himself in the breaking of the bread and the wine and they finally saw Jesus. He says, fear not. Fear not, for I am with you. Death is nothing to fear. We live forever. Our debt has been paid in full. The devil has been vanquished, all on the account of Jesus Christ. May God fill you with hope and peace in believing that the solid and simple message is also for us. In Jesus' name, amen. In the words of the Apostles' Creed, where together we confess, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord Jesus, you conquered death, you conquered our debt, and you conquered the devil. And the death that haunts us, haunts us no more in Christ. For we have life and light and a future. And the debt that would suffocate us has been paid. And the devil that tries to kidnap us has been dealt with. We ask you by your grace, Heavenly Father, to give us eyes of faith and not fear. Help us to see ourselves constantly as you see us. You see us in Christ as valiant and strong and capable as spirit-driven warriors of the faith and of this life. We ask you, by your grace, make our witness for Christ strong. Make it so strong the world will see in our eyes the power of the gospel and be compelled by your spirit to listen to our testimonies of your presence in our lives. Give us, both individually and as a congregation, give us boldness, Boldness that comes from the knowledge that we are, as your scripture says, more than conquerors through him who loved us. Help us to live convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither this present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Gracious God, as grandparents, And as parents, may our witness for Christ be consistent with your message of hope and love and grace. As we raise our children and our grandchildren, allow us to do so in the confidence that comes from knowing you, from being filled with your spirit, from being a sinner redeemed by your blood, and being taught about your love and your grace, about our holy and righteous identity as your children in Christ. Lord, we... We ask that you would bless our children, 
that they would grow up well-balanced, living lives of laughter and purpose, lives that are significant as followers of Christ. And may, may our children learn how to live with laughter and purpose and significance in Christ by following our example as parents and grandparents, by copying their spiritual leaders, what they do and what they say. And we all, and as we all form lifelong bonds with these students and kids, our children, our grandchildren, that will continue through eternity. We ask you, Lord, to light a fire within us that by this holy motivation we will live lives of discovery, finding new people for whom to pray and new ways to be the hands and feet and the voice of Christ for people that are anxiously searching for hope and acceptance. And may the fire of your Spirit that fills our hearts be so evident in those around us that we, that those around us might, might serve as a, that we might serve as a beacon of hope and life to everyone in our community. Lord Jesus, these prayers and all the prayers in the hearts of your people we offer up to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In Jesus, your precious name, amen. You're welcome to be seated as we continue with the communion hymn, O Jesus, King Most Wonderful. truly good and right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you holy lord holy father almighty and everlasting god for the countless blessings that you so freely bestow on us and all creation above all we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten son jesus christ into our flesh and laid on him our sin giving him into death that we might not die eternally because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Amen. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the night in which he is betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks... He gave it to them, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Sanctified and kept in the one true faith, we pray the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Welcome to the Lord's table.
May this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you now and forever. Depart with joy and peace. Amen. Amen. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith towards you and in fervent love towards one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our benediction is from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Amen. Our final hymn, Christ the Eternal Lord. Serve the Lord. <laughs>